Hi, everyone. Um, this is a talk basically about bit flips. In other words, single bit errors in memory. And it's about how to cause them and how to exploit them. And specifically, it's about exploiting bit flips caused by a particular hardware bug known as the Rohammer bug. So this is a fault with many DRAM modules manufactured from around 2010 onwards. And the bug is that repeatedly reading from one page in memory can cause corruption in other pages. And potentially those pages can be used by other processes or by the kernel. So this bug is dangerous because it, these errors bypass memory protection. And all of the three largest DRAM manufacturers have shipped DRAM with this fault. So there's a whole generation of machines out there that are prone to this problem. But this, this talk isn't just about one bug. It's also about the connection between reliability and security. So in the past, memory, for example, memory corruption bugs and crashes were often treated as being just reliability issues. But people started coming up with increasingly clever ways to exploit those bugs. So the software industry has gradually been realizing that these bugs aren't just reliability issues. They're more dangerous than that. So the software industry has been learning this lesson. But I think a lot of the hardware industry hasn't caught up yet based on how they responded to the Rohammer bug. So I'm going to talk a bit about how software can cause bit flips using the Rohammer bug. And I'll talk about the two proof of concept privilege escalation exploits that I wrote that can use these bit flips to escalate privileges. Then, then I'll talk about mitigations and how the industry responded to the bug. And a lot of this was, um, was covered in the blog post that we published on the Google Project Zero blog earlier this year. But I'll also talk about one more topic that we've learned more about since then, which is about the possibility of doing row hammering from JavaScript. So a little bit about us. Um, so I usually work on building sandboxes rather than breaking them. And I've worked on a few different sandboxing systems, including some Linux sandboxes and the native client sandbox. And uh, lately, when I've found bugs, I've tried to write exploits for them. And I found that to be quite an educational thing to do. Um, and that's, that's kind of what I did here. Um, I, I've also found that writing exploits helps to get other people to take security bugs more seriously. Um, so I really want the sandboxes that I build to, to work and to actually be secure. And unfortunately, I found I had to write exploits for Rohammer in order to get people to take it more seriously and to actually fix it. And uh, good day. My name is Harvar. I'm going to be a co-presenter here. And uh, I've been doing exploitation for a long while. Uh, and I really quite like to work on tricky to exploit flaws. And this was a rather tricky to exploit one. Um, we announced that we are going to talk a little bit about DRAM errors and how to, to cause these DRAM errors. Oh, sorry. Yes. Um, and uh, before we do that, though, we should have uh, a look at perhaps completely random bit flips that are not induced by an attacker that just happen randomly. And there's a, a fairly interesting paper from 2003 where a few academics tried to examine exactly the scenario. What they did there is they hooked up a heating lamp to the RAM of a machine in order to induce heat-induced uh, bit flips in DRAM. Um, and then they showed how they can use this to break out of the Java sandbox. And the way they did this is the Java uh, application would fill all of the memory of the, the Java VM with references to objects. And when a bit would flip in one of these references, the reference would then point to a different object of a different type, which would then violate the security assumptions of the Java sandbox. So it's not an entirely new thing to look at random bit flips uh, for exploitation. And it's been something that has been, been on my mind for a long, for long while. There was a paper in 2009 published by Google, actually, um, that examined the prevalence of truly random bit flips in the big server fleet that Google has, because Google is monitoring these things. And it was really quite interesting, because you had quantitative numbers in terms of how often does a bit just flip randomly in DRAM without any interaction. And that leads to a fairly interesting thought experiment, because these days you can buy ad impressions, and these ad impressions allow you to run JavaScript or, or Flash inside of somebody else's computer. So this leads to a fairly obvious thought experiment in terms of, well, if random bit flips happen this and, so, like, this and that often, and if I can exploit them to, to gain privileges outside, like from a JavaScript sandbox or from a, a Flash sandbox, um, 
how many ad impressions do I need to buy before I will compromise a machine just purely randomly by, by DRAM flipping a bit. Turns out that it's not quite cost effective yet, but it was an interesting thing to, to look into. Um, in fact, though, the sort of memory error we're dealing with here, Rohammer, is very, very different from the truly random model. Because the thing that makes the attack really quite reliable is the fact that we're not randomly flipping bits. We're flipping one bit deterministically. We can't choose the bit. The assignment of that bit is fairly random. But once we see that bit flip, we can make it flip repeatedly. And it is that repeatability of the bit flip that makes the exploit so, so reliable. OK, so now I'll talk a bit about Rohammer specifically. But first, um, I'll give an intro how to DRAM works. So DRAM is the main memory of a computer. It's short for dynamic RAM. And a bank of DRAM basically consists of a big array of cells where each cell stores one bit. So DRAM is quite high capacity. And the reason for that is the circuitry for a cell is very simple and compact. So a cell consists of basically just a capacitor and a transistor. And the presence or absence of charge on that capacitor indicates whether it's, it's storing a 0 or a 1. And be, but because this arrangement is so simple, cells can't be accessed individually. So instead, DRAM is divided into rows. So you can only access one row at a time. So if the system wants to access a particular row, it has to first tell the bank to activate that row. And that basically connects this row cells to something called the row buffer. And that drains the, the charge from the cells. And in doing so, it copies the row's data into the bank's row buffer. And then the system can read or write the contents of the row buffer. And if the system wants to access a different row, then first the DRAM bank has to write the data that's in the row ba buffer back into where it came from. And that involves putting charge back into the row cells. So basically, a, DRAM, um, a bank of DRAM has a notion of a currently activated row. And that acts a bit like a cache. So accessing the current row is fast, and accessing a different row is somewhat slower. So that's basically how rows work. And the other thing to note about DRAM is that because the cells are capacitors, charge tends to leak out of them. So the contents of cells have to be periodically refreshed. And that's why it's called dynamic RAM. And refreshing a row works the same way as accessing it. So the system rows, uh, reads a row, a, a row into the row buffer and then writes it back. And the current standard is that a given row should be refreshed at least every 64 milliseconds, which is about 16 times a second. So in other words, a cell has to hold its contents for at least 64 milliseconds. But, so that's, that's the intro to how DRAM works. But um, now I'll talk about one way in which it goes wrong. So I explained that cells have to hold their contents for 64 milliseconds. But DRAM manufacturers started screwing up by making DRAM where the cells don't always hold their contents for that long. And the particular problem is that if you repeatedly activate a row many, many times, then on some DRAM modules, some of the cells in neighboring rows can lose their values in a time shorter than the 64 milliseconds that they're supposed to keep them for. And this is known as the row hammer problem because repeatedly activating a row is referred to as hammering the row. And the reason this has happened is that over time, DRAM manufacturers have been squeezing more and more cells onto a chip. And as they've done that, they put the cells closer together. And the result is that the cells aren't as well isolated from each other as they used to be. So maybe charge can leak between them more readily. And as they store less charge, then they're more vulnerable to being disturbed. So I don't know the exact electrical explanation, but the, the end result is that these disturbances are observable, for, observable from software, and software can cause them too. And so basically, this, this problem tends to be associated with particular bad cells in a DRAM module. And those are, tend to be randomly distributed throughout a module. And a lot of those bad cells will consistently get bit errors when the neighboring row is hammered. They do tend to have a preferred direction for flipping. So some bad cells will tend to flip from a 0 to a 1, and others from a 1 to a 0. Um, that direction can change, though, across a reboot, because memory controllers tend to do this thing called data scrambling. And the seed for that scrambling is, is changed on the reboot. 
So this amount of this, this proportion of bad cells can, can vary quite a bit between DRAM modules. So, um, for example, the percentage of rows containing bad cells can vary from anything from 30% to 99.9%. .9%. And also the number of row activations that you need to cause one of these um, errors uh, can, can vary. Um, on one module, it was as low as 98,000 row activations, which was about 8% of what the DDR3 said that that module was supposed to be able to ex um, take. And the main reason we know about this is that there was a paper published about it last year by a group at CMU. It's entitled um, Flipping Bits in Memory Without Accessing Them. There are actually three other papers um, published about it too, but they weren't quite as well publicized and they weren't as detailed. And so the CMU paper was published in, in June last year, and I came across it later in September. And the reason I mention this is it was that it didn't take me very long, actually, to work out how to exploit this, compared with how long the industry has known about this problem. So about four days after reading the paper, I found I could repro the problem on a spare laptop that I had. And then about four weeks after reading the paper, I had a, a knackle, a, an exploit for native client working. And about 12 weeks after, I had um, a kernel exploit working. So, so in contrast to that timeline, the origins of the problem go back to about four years earlier. So the earliest laptops and DRAM that I know of that had the problem are from about 2010. And there's a paper and some patent applications about the problem from 2012. So the industry knew about this for a while, but it was generally keeping quite quiet about the problem until the splash made by the CMU paper last summer. OK, so I've talked about the, the basic problem. And I'll, now I'll talk a bit about how you can cause row hammering from software. And that's one of the things that the CMU paper explained. They had a, a fragment of code that showed how you could do this from software. So the, the, basic, the basic problem here is how can you cause repeated activations of a row? And there are basically two requirements for that. The first one is that you have to cause accesses to the underlying DRAM. So you can't just do normal memory accesses because to, to the same um, memory location repeatedly because that will, those will get served from the cache. Um, so you have to find a way to bypass the cache. And on an x86 machine, the simplest way to do that is to use the CL flush instruction, which flushes a cache line. And interestingly, uh, CL flush is an unprivileged instruction, so any process can use it. And it actually can't be disabled, um, which is slightly surprising because on other architectures like ARM, the, the equivalent cache flush instruction is actually privileged. However, so if you do a CL flushed access to a single address, that by itself is not going to do row hammering because those accesses will all go to the same row. So the second requirement is um, to do row hammering, you have to pick more than two addresses, or at least, sorry, at least two addresses in different rows and access them alternately. And that forces changes to the current row. And there is another requirement too. So um, the two addresses you pick have to be in the same bank. So that's because DRAM modules are divided into banks. And each bank has its own independent current row. So if you were to pick two addresses in the same bank, um, then that would activate the, the, the different the, the rows in those banks just once, and it wouldn't be causing repeated activations. So this, so this gives the question, how can we find a pair of addresses that do map to different rows in the same bank? And initially, that seems like it would be difficult for a normal process to do. Because there's, there's two levels of indirection that get in the way. So the process normally sees virtual addresses, and those are mapped to physical addresses by the OS via page tables. And then the memory controller maps those physical addresses to locations in the DRAM, which includes the, the bank number and the row number. Um, so the first mapping is generally hidden, and the second mapping isn't documented, or you can, although you can reverse engineer it, although that can be a bit complicated sometimes. 
But well, the insight that I had was you don't actually need to know about those two mappings to do row hammering from a normal process because we can just pick address pairs randomly. Um, so typically the number of banks is actually quite small. It's something like eight or 16. So that means we've got an eight, a one in eight or a one in 16 chance of getting two addresses that are in the same bank. And those are actually really good odds because we can try many address pairs in turn as we search for a pair that can cause a bit error. And the result of all this is my Rohammer test program, which is on GitHub, and it has reproed bit flips on quite a few different machines. And so it's fairly simple. Um, it allocates a gigabyte of memory, and then it tries to hammer that memory, and it looks for bit, for bit flips in that memory. And it's kind of risky to run in principle because it could corrupt other processes or it could corrupt the kernel, although it doesn't often do that in practice, I think. Um, and so we tested a selection of laptops with this test, and we got bit flips on about half of them, although that proportion isn't necessarily very meaningful because of selection bias in the, the sample we tested. And the results are on our blog post. And also, this test hasn't been fine-tuned, so there are um, well, we, there are cases where um, a system could be vulnerable and the test won't detect that. All right. And uh, so there, there are a number of refinements you can do to the basic row hammer testing. And I think one of the important refinements we want to talk about here is something that we call double-sided hammering. And um, the entire thing started with patient zero, uh, the, the first laptop that uh, Mark reproduced the bit flips on. And we were lucky in the sense that that laptop was really bad in terms of RAM. And because it was so bad, we got a lot of data from that laptop that then allowed us to refine uh, our, our approach to hammering. Because normally, when you hammer a laptop, uh, you may get one bit flip every, like, in a given time frame. It's very frustrating to draw inferences and make experiments when the laptop doesn't consistently flip bits. It drives you insane. So we're lucky to have uh, Flippy. Flippy the laptop, uh, Flippy's RAM uh, is stellarly bad. And when I say stellarly bad is now that we know how to hammer Flippy, we can cause 50 bits to flip and more in an area of eight kilobytes. So that's uh, a lot of bits flipping. Um, and the, the nice thing really is that Flippy being so prone to, to causing and having bit flips was great for the research that we did. So what we did is uh, we ran this row hammer test for a couple of days. And row hammer test now was searching through physical addresses, uh, trying to find addresses that will cause bit flips when hammered. And after we had run it for a couple of days, we took all these addresses that we had seen to cause bit flips, and then we hammered them again, this time not randomized, but seriously just these addresses. And uh, we collected the data from it and then started looking at it. And uh, we ended up with this interesting plot where the x-axis is the number of bits that ended up flipping when we hammered two addresses. And then on the y-axis, you see uh, the log two of the delta between the address where the bit flips occurred and the addresses which we hammered. And you see on the far left side that when you have one or two bit flips, uh, the, the delta to where you're hammering is pretty much all over the place. There's a lot of variation there. But to the right-hand side, you see fairly consistently, well, this is just an illustration. So you see we're hammering, like a, a blue triangle means this is hammering above one of the, the addresses that we were targeting. A red triangle is the other target that we're hammering. And uh, what we saw very quickly is that any time we got more than a few bit flips, like many bit flips, 20 plus and so forth, um, we had a fixed distance that we were hammering from the target area where the bit flips were occurring of roughly 256k above and below. Meaning that, well, if you picked your addresses correctly, then out of a sudden on models or on laptops of the same model, you would be much better at hammering. And we, we thought about what's going on here, and uh, then we understood what was happening. And what was happening is the following. On the left-hand side here, you see uh, a diagram that explains to you, or that, that illustrates what happens when you're hammering. So on the left-hand side, we're activating two rows that are quite far from each other. And every time you activate one of those, um, it influences its neighboring rows somehow that, to make them more prone to bit flipping. Um, and this is illustrated by them being in orange. But now on the right-hand side, we're picking two rows in a way that there's exactly one row in the middle, which means that middle row will get hit on every activation, not only on one activation every time. And this hammering from two sides at once um, turns a lot of machines that we previously thought were not vulnerable into vulnerable. So my work laptop at the time, in which I was writing the code that I was running on Flippy, 
um, had been thought to be not vulnerable. And then I wrote the code for double-sided hammering and accidentally at one point launched it on my laptop, in, uh, on my work laptop, instead of on Flippy. And all of a sudden it started producing bit flips there. So that was a, a big realization for us that if you figure out how to, to hammer for a particular laptop model, you get much better at hammering for that model. The difficulty though is that um, you need to pick aggressor rows that are exactly two apart. And because the mapping between virtual memory and physical memory, uh, and then, well not virtual memory and physical memory, but the mapping between physical addresses and the actual banks is different uh, between different laptops. Um, that means that you really, if, if you really want to be effective at hammering a particular laptop, you probably want to have experiments on a laptop of the same type just to make sure that you're uh, picking the right distances between addresses to hammer. Um, and we were lucky in the sense that we had a very vulnerable laptop that provided us with enough data so we could infer the proper distances and then use those proper distances to hammer other laptops which then turned out to be vulnerable but we thought were not vulnerable initially. And it's, it's almost a pattern that occurred during this, this research that the hammering got better over time as we figured out more uh, about it. Right. Um, yeah, in fact, or in, in practice, there's, there's of course the problem that uh, you need to A, figure out the mapping for the particular laptop model, and then you also need to be able to go from virtual memory to at least physical memory um, relative addressing, meaning you need to be able to pick two physical addresses that are a particular distance apart. And on the Linux, it is fairly easy because Linux does provide you, or used to provide you, with a self page map, which tells you virtual to physical mapping. It doesn't anymore, I think. But um, long story short, if you don't have the ability to address uh, physical memory in that sense, the randomized hammering approach of the original Roy Hammond test may be more, more appropriate at the cost of causing fewer bit flips. Okay, so we've, we've talked about how you can cause bit flips. Now I'm going to talk a bit about how you can exploit that. So, so earlier we, we posed the question of how you would exploit a bit flip at a completely random place in physical memory. And there's actually a generic strategy you could use for that. And the, the JVM exploit that Halvar mentioned earlier is an example of that strategy. So firstly, we would want to find a data structure to attack. And that should be one where um, a single bit error at a random location has quite a good chance of increasing our privileges. And then we would try and fill as much memory as possible with that data structure. And then try and cause bit flips to occur or wait for them. And then somehow we'd need to figure out whether a useful bit flip has occurred and then if it did, try and make use of it. So I basically built two privilege escalation exploits using the Rohammer bug, and they both use um, that generic strategy. So the first one escapes from the native client sandbox. So NACL, sorry, native client is an in-process sandbox that's used in the Chrome web browser. And breaking out that sandbox means an attacker can run arbitrary code inside the host process. And the second exploit is a root exploit, which starts out running in a normal process on Linux, but can break out of that process and gain kernel privileges and control over the whole machine. So in principle, those two exploits could be chained together, although I've not actually tried that. So you could start off with a, NACL, a native client application running in Chrome, and it could escalate to gain control over the whole machine. And interestingly, it will be using the same underlying hardware bug for both of those exploit steps. So I think that's, that's significant, because it, it's significant because it shows that these um, bit flips are exploitable in multiple contexts. So each exploit is not a, a one-off. So even if a system uses multiple layers of security, it's possible that multiple layers can be vulnerable to Rohama. So I'll talk about the, um, the native client exploit first. So uh, native client is known as NACL for short. And this is the exploit that I got working first because it was the easier one to do and because I'm, I'm more familiar with, with NACL. So, so NACL is basically a sandboxing system for running native code such as C and C++ programs. And it's used in Chrome. And Chrome allows um, one variant of NACL called portable native client to be used by any web page. Though I should point out that my exploit only targets uh, a different variant of NACL that's only usable by apps in the Chrome Web Store. Um, so NACL's goal is basically to make C and C++, C and C++ code as safe as JavaScript. 
And it's kind of similar in that respect to ASM.js. And, and like ASM.js, it's an in-process sandbox. Um, so it's memory the memory access of a program inside that sandbox are limited to a range of the processor's address space. So if you have a sandbox like that, um, there's a generic strategy that you can use for escaping an in-process sandbox. So firstly, you would try to get your shell code, your attack code, marked as executable. And for Knuckle, that's actually fairly easy. And in the, second, the second step would be to try and cause a jump to that shell code. And that's the main challenge in this case for Knuckle. Um, the way we get the shell code marked as executable is actually kind of similar to how uh, JIT spraying techniques are used for exploiting JavaScript JITs. Basically, we can hide the code inside other x86 instructions. And that's kind of easy to do for NACL because NACL allows loading any chunk of x86 code as long as it passes NACL's validator. So the validator is this thing that checks that code uses a safe set of x86 instructions and that the code passes some other safety properties. And NACL safety basically works by ensuring you can only do indirect jumps to 32 byte aligned addresses. And NACL makes sure those addresses only contain safe instructions. But if you can find a way to jump to a non-32 byte aligned address, you can escape the sandbox because you can hide other instructions at those addresses. Like in the example in the slide, you can hide an unsafe syscall instruction inside a safe movabs instruction. So normally NACL enforces this safety property by saying indirect jumps can only, use, can only be done via this instruction sequence shown in the slide, which forces the destination to be aligned. Um, but of course, NACL assumes that after it's loaded and validated this code, it doesn't change. If, but if we get row hammer bit flips inside this code, then it can easily become unsafe. So that's basically the approach I use in this exploit. We, we load many copies of this code into memory, and then we try and cause bit flips in the code. And my exploit can actually use, can actually exploit bit flips in any of the register numbers in this code fragment. And then, then, then it would use those to jump to the hidden shell code. If the exploit gets a bit flip in another part of the code that's not a register number, then it actually can't, it can't exploit those, but it's not gonna crash, it will just detect that and carry on until it finds another bit flip. So it's a fairly low risk strategy. And actually unit tested the exploit to make sure that it handles all those possible bit flips correctly. So this, this means that about 13% of the possible bit flips in this code sequence are exploitable by my proof of concept code. And those are, those are quite good odds because we can just keep trying until we get one that is exploitable. And I should also point out that there are two aspects of the NACL sandbox that make this attack a bit easier. So NACL allows dynamic loading of code, so we can load lots of copies of this, of this sequence. And also NACL, more importantly, NACL allows a program to read its own code segment. So we can read that code segment to see if we've got any bit flips to the code. And that's in contrast to um, JavaScript VMs where typically the code is hidden. I think if Knuckle hid the code, it would make, make exploitation harder, but I think it would still be possible because you could probably figure out a, a way to do it. Uh, that, oh, and um, so basically we can, um, we can also hammer that code segment by doing CL flushed accesses to it, which does bring me on to the next point, which although Knuckle um, can, can enforce that only a subset of instructions are used, that subset did include CL flush. Oops. Um, I think the reason it was allowed was because someone was asking the question, is there any reason this shouldn't be disallowed? And according to the x86 spec, it's safe, but unfortunately that's not the right question to ask because um, there wasn't really any good reason to be allowing it either. And, and we've, we've also since changed the validator to disallow CL flush. Okay, so I've described how you can escape the NACL sandbox. Um, 
once you've done that, what can you do? Well, there's actually not an awful lot you can do because we're still inside a process level sandbox that's fairly strict and we're not inside the renderer process so you can't steal cookies. But we could try um, escaping from the process level sandbox too and that's what the next exploit tries to do, although it's not specific to ex escaping from a NACL process. Okay, so I'll explain the kernel exploit now. And in this case, the data structure that we attack is page tables. So just a little bit of background about page tables, computer science recap here. Um, so they're the data structure that the hardware uses for mapping a process's virtual addresses to the, hard, to the machine's physical addresses. And they're set up by the kernel. So for example, if you, if you allocate a page of memory using mmap, then the kernel allocates a physical page, and it also sets up a page table that points to that physical page. Now, OSs also tend to have features for shared memory that let us map the same page multiple times. So if we do that, um, if we create a shared memory segment and mmap it multiple times, then we'll get lots of page tables pointing to the same physical pages. And suppose we create a two megabyte segment of shared memory and mmap it 10,000 times, each mapping is gonna result in creating one 4K page table. So we would get about 40, we will get page tables filling 40 megabytes of physical memory. And if we scale that up, we can actually use this to fill most of the physical memory with page tables. And actually Linux lets us do this because it doesn't have any bound on the number of page tables that you can create. It does have a bound on the number of mappings a process can create, but that's actually not a problem for us because we can just make our mappings a bit bigger and we can still fill physical memory with page tables. So once we've done that, what happens if we get a random single bit error somewhere in one of those page tables? Well, if we're lucky, then it will change the physical page, no a page number in a page table entry, so it now points to a different physical page. And since we've filled most of the physical memory with page tables, it's quite likely that the new physical page number is gonna be one of the page tables that describes our process's address space. So if that happens, we've just broken the safety of the system. So we've got access to a physical page that we weren't supposed to have access to, in particular one of our own page tables. And if that happens, then we can modify that page table to point to any physical address that we like. So we now have read-write access to all of physical memory. Um, we do have to work out which virtual address the page table is, is um, corresponds to, but that's actually fairly straightforward because we can scan address space to find it. We would just have to scan to find a page that now points to something that wasn't the shared memory segment we mapped. So we can't, unlike for the NACL exploit, we can't look for the bit flip directly um, because we can't read the page tables directly, but we can scan virtual addresses to find it. And so once we've got access to all the physical memory, it's actually, um, there's a lot of uh, options for how you would use that for a, a practical exploit. So in, in my proof of concept, um, it, it can run a command as root. So the way I did that was to find a phys the physical page number of some code that belongs to a set UID executable, and then we can override that, overwrite that code and then run the executable. But potentially we could do other things like modify the kernel's code or we could search through memory to find some other interesting pages to modify. So earlier I said that if we're lucky, the bit flip would change the page number in the page table entry. But actually we don't need to be slaves to randomness here. We can actually make our own luck. The idea is that we can take advantage of the fact that Rohammer bit flips are often repeatable. So we can find a victim page that's got a bad memory cell at an offset that's useful to us. And then we can deallocate that page with M on map, hands it back to the kernel while keeping our aggressor pages map, are allocated. And then we can get the kernel to reuse that page as a page table and then cause that memory cell to flip again so this is kind of similar to how you might exploit a use after free bug, 
basically we can make a modification to a page even though the kernel thinks we haven't got access to that page. And we can also check in advance that the bit that's going to flip is going to be one that's useful to our, to our exploit. So we know what the format of a page table is. We can check that the bit flip is going to hit a, a bit in the physical page number that's going to be useful. So we don't want it to hit one of the high bits because that would um, give a physical page number that's out of range and that might cause a kernel panic. We will basically, so on a four gigabyte machine, for example, we'd want to make sure the bit flip occurs in one of the bottom 20 bits of the physical page number. So this means that about 20 of 64 possible bit flips are useful to us. Um, which is pretty good odds still. That's like a, that's a third or so. Um, this also, this knowledge of which bit is going to fit also lets us speed up the exploit because we know in advance which of the entries in a page table is going to change. So when we're spraying physical memory with page tables, we don't have to get all of the entries in a page table populated. We only have to get one of the 512 entries populated. And that just speeds up the spraying process a lot. And the result is we can spray memory at about one gig gigabyte a second. And there's, other one, there's one other refinement I should mention. So when we're allocating the shared memory segment that we repeatedly map, Linux does, does tend to allocate that contiguously. And we need to avoid that. Otherwise, if a bit flips in one of the low numbers of the physical, its physical pages, it's probably still going to point into the same shared memory segment. So I came up with a, um, a simple way to deal with that, which is just to force physical memory to be fragmented by allocating a lot of memory and then by deallocating it one page at a time in a random order. So that's basically the kernel exploit. Um, I'll talk about a little bit about mitigations now for the Rohammer problem. Um, so there are basically three mitigations. There's ECC, which you've probably heard of. There's t target row refresh, which you probably haven't heard of. And then there's um, doubling the refresh rate, which is fairly self-explanatory. So, so the first mitigation is to use ECC memory. Um, so ECC is a pretty good mitigation for Rohammer. And most servers do use it, although lower end lap machines like laptops don't tend to have it. So ECC can correct some errors, but not all of them. It usually depends on how many bit errors you get for a per 64-bit word. So if you get one error, ECC can correct that. If you get two, ECC can detect it, but it can't correct it. And that usually leads to a reboot. But if you get three errors, ECC can't even detect that. And those errors will be visible to software. So the number of errors you get is generally going to depend on how bad your DRAM is. If you've got really bad DRAM, you could get a three-bit error. But I think it's more likely that an attacker would cause a two-bit error first and trigger a reboot. So you'd get a lot of reboots before this would be exploitable. So basically, ECC reduces the problem to being a denial of service problem rather than privilege escalation problem. So that is better, but it's not ideal. So ECC doesn't really deal with the, the root of the problem because it's not, it's not really well suited to dealing with systematic errors. So the, um, the second mitigation is called target row refresh. And this is, this is specific to Rohammer. It, does, it requires some hardware changes, um, but it does kind of get to the root of the problem more. So the idea behind target row refresh is to count the number of times each row is activated. And if the count for a row reaches a particular threshold, then the system would refresh the row's neighboring rows and there's two levels at which you could implement that. So you could implement it in the CPU's memory controller, or you could implement it in the DRAM itself. And it appears that vendors are using both approaches. So um, one DRAM maker's data sheets indicate that they are implementing TRR in their newer DDR4 chips. Um, It also it appears that Intel are implementing TRR in their CPU's memory controllers. Unfortunately, it's not really clear 
which CPUs implement that. Um, so there is one PDF of an Intel presentation from a conference that says that some Xeon CPUs support something called pseudo TRR, although I've not found any more public documentation about that. Okay, so that's, that's TRR, and um, it does require newer hardware. So is there anything that we can do to mitigate Rohammer on existing machines? So fortunately, there is one existing mitigation, and that's to increase the memory's refresh rate, and that's the third mitigation. And you can do that with a BIOS update, and some vendors have been doing that. They usually double the refresh rate. So basically, an attacker can only do half as many RAR activations as they could before between refreshes. There is a question about whether that, well, that's enough, though. Um, the CMU paper has a graph which shows that even when you're doing one-sided hammering, a double refresh rate isn't always enough to eliminate all the errors. So maybe an attacker would just have to take longer before they can trigger a, a bit flips. And this doesn't even take account for two-sided row hammering, which would, is more likely to cause flips. So having talked about mitigations, um, I think it's, it's going to become more interesting to see whether they're getting applied, because it's becoming more apparent that it's possible to do row hammering from JavaScript, which is the, this next section I'll talk about. So originally, it seemed like this would be difficult to do, because you can't use CL flush from JavaScript. JavaScript can normally only do normal cached memory accesses. Um, so you would need to find a pattern of accesses that can generate a high rate of cache misses. And initially, it seems like you would have to figure out how to get cache misses at all of the cache levels, so L1, L2, and L3. However, it turns out that's easier than it initially seems, because on current Intel CPUs, evicting a cache line from the L3 cache also evicts it from L1 and L2. So the L1 and L2 caches don't actually matter for our purposes of row hammering. So um, if we want to generate L3 caches, there's a, the trick would be to find many addresses that map to the same cache set. So for example, in a typical system might have a 12-way set associative cache. If you can find 13 addresses that map to a cache set, then accessing them will generate at least one cache miss. And it turns out there's already an algorithm for finding addresses that have that property. And it already works in JavaScript. And it works by timing memory accesses. Uh, it's described in a paper called The Spy in the Sandbox. So that gives us a way to generate cache misses. The next question is whether we can generate cache misses that are optimal for row hammering. So ideally, we would want, the, we would want the, the misses to be for just two addresses. Well, in the last um, two weeks, a group has, um, from Austria and France have published a draft paper about how to do this. And they've got a clever algorithm for finding the right ordering of memory accesses that even works on newer CPUs like Haswell, um, where the cache eviction, is quite, uh, cache eviction policy is quite complex. And it can generate an optimal um, set of, of cache misses. So I think the remaining thing um, that will be interesting to see is we can also cause Rohammer bit flips on ARM devices, which I don't think anyone has really tried hard to do yet. Given that the average quality of DRAM in, C uh, in cell phones is likely to be worse than in laptops, that may be interesting. So, um, so that's, that's the JavaScript side of things. Um, so I think there are software bugs. To conclude, there are some software bugs that are easier to exploit than Rohammer. But as software level sandboxes are getting better, um, I think it might be the case that uh, attackers turn to, exploit, to exploiting more esoteric bugs like Rohammer. And we have seen multiple times that Rohammer can actually be easier to exploit than it initially seems. So picking how we pick addresses was one example of that. And row hammering from JavaScript was another example of that. And this is kind of unusual for being a hardware bug. So normally, the hardware can hide physics level issues, um, like charge leaking. But occasionally, the hardware manufacturers do screw up, and they push things too far. So maybe we will see issues like this again in the future. And in general, it's, it's quite difficult to verify what the, that the hardware does what it's supposed to do. And vendors haven't been terribly open about Rohammer in particular. <laughs>
So I would like to see vendors be more open and, and to adopt a security mindset when they're thinking about these issues that appear to be just reliability issues because we've, we've shown that they can actually break multiple layers of security. So, so lastly, um, if you, to see more information about this, we have some test code on, on GitHub and a mailing list for discussing the uh, problem and exploits for it. And you can also see the, the Project Zero blog post that we posted. Any questions? Yes, please. So the first, the, the question was whether Rowhammer would work to escape from a hypervisor-based sandbox, and the second question is whether um, it would be possible to cause a Rowhammer kernel exploit from JavaScript. Um, when it comes to the hypervisor, at least in theory, there is nothing that would stop Rowhammer from being useful for hypervisor, but the same principle would apply that we mentioned earlier. We would need to be able to pack memory full of a data structure that when a bit flips, it's useful for us. So it would somewhat depend on what data structures the hypervisor allows the virtualized environment to, to allocate, and we haven't looked into that. As to the second question, causing a kernel exploit from JavaScript, I think it may be easier for the attacker to first cause regular code execution within that process from JavaScript by, uh, I mean, the, the JavaScript interpreter does JIT these days. So it's quite possible that the attacker is capable of um, escaping the JavaScript jitted code and run native code, and then from that native code use the kernel escalation. Yeah, you do a two-step thing like in the, that we did here, yeah, I think. Yeah, so th that, that is just the, the, basically the same thing that you showed. Yeah. The question is whether you think it would be possible not to use that, but just to use the JavaScript to go straight to the kernel. I think that's going to be much harder. If you find a way to fill physical memory with a data structure that the kernel, uh, that, that has privileged escalation potential from JavaScript, then it should be possible. But I don't know, like I don't have a good idea on how to do it off the top of my head. Um, hello. Are you aware of memory scrambling as a mitigation measure that I, I contacted my server provider when this happened and they said kind of this can be enabled in BIOS and as far as I understand it, it would change the memory mapping in a way that what the operating system sees as hardware addresses are not really the hardware addresses in memory. So it I would think if you're doing address scrambling, that could probably help mitigate for double-sided hammering, but not for one-sided hammering. So that, that there's a distinction between data scrambling and address scrambling. So I think, I think you were talking about address scrambling, which would probably help. I think data scrambling wouldn't, wouldn't help. In a server scenario, you're probably better off with ECC. Like the, the odds of an attacker being able to escalate privileges without rebooting the machine when you have ECC are nil essentially. Did that answer the question? Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Just go one back one slide. One slide back, yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. We do not know. We just uh, we did some very superficial research into trying to cause it on ARM, but we didn't try very hard, so we have no idea. Any other questions? Do you think it would be easier to cause raw power from Java object or Java? Like, is there any benefit to actually giving some of the byte code oriented language? I think it would be the same for Java or JavaScript. Yeah. I think the, because the JIT is going to, to yeah. uh, I think in both cases the JIT is going to generate native code which then has to have the proper access patterns so I don't think it matters much. All right, I think we're out of time. Uh, any other questions right outside? Thanks a lot.